Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. And the prayer I'm going to pray is a prayer that comes from the order of St. Luke Publications. It's written by Dan Benedict. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. God, whose word cannot be broken, with Jerusalem we are stunned this holy week. Like a city overcome with sudden devastation, we are swept up in the confusion and desolation, wondering what is happening. Liturgy, scripture, and song. Immerse us in the river that flows to betrayal and the cross. The gospel we have tried to make manageable has overturned our tables of control. The sufferings of Jesus that we try to avoid now engulf us. The fruitless fig tree withers before the majesty of the one whose mission is relentless and uncompromised. Help us with all of your church to watch and pray, to behold anew the unfolding scandal and the ragged good news of salvation. Behold with mercy the agonies of the world where the suffering of Jesus is being completed, both then and now. Let the Via Dolorosa for us be both acts of devotion and worship and of compassion and justice, so that Christ's abundant sufferings become the world's abundant consolations. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we said over the next four days, we'll be focusing on the Gospel of John. And so we begin to read from John 18, verse 1. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Jesus, Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. As we read, Jesus knew the place. Judas knew the place to where Jesus was going. 
having been there with Jesus on many occasions. And so we read, he guided a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees to the garden. It is generally believed that such a detachment would compromise about 40 to 50 soldiers, even though it could be as much as 600. But it's unlikely a whole unit was used to arrest just one man. The unit was possibly mobilized for fear of any possibility of a riot breaking out when they took Jesus. Because we must remember that it was the time of the Passover and there were thousands of pilgrims in the city. And so they arrived with their torches, lanterns and weapons because it was night. Again, as we noted last evening, John would not have us miss the absurdity of this encounter. The futility of anyone looking for Jesus, who is the light of the world, with a mere lantern. As the ancient Eastern proverb goes, do you need proof of God? Does one light a torch to see the sun? Without the light of the world in their lives, their darkness is dark indeed. And no torch or lantern can remove that darkness in the hearts of those who do not seek his light. Jesus knows exactly what's happening. He makes no attempt to escape just as he had done on so many other occasions. For as we saw last night, he already knew the risks of venturing out at night, knowing that he had been betrayed. And so he does not wait for Judas to step forward and identify him. He takes the initiative. He steps forward and asks, who is it that you want? Yes, the other gospel writers say that Judas identified Jesus with a kiss. But not so, John. Not that he is denying that Judas did that. But he denies that it is that which identified Jesus. For in the end, it is Jesus who identifies himself. And so they answer, Jesus of Nazareth, In this moment, there is a spiritual standoff between light and darkness. Two bands of men, one representing the legalism of religion and the other the liberty of relationship. As the soldiers face off with the disciples, One is a band of soldiers with weapons, lanterns, and torches in hand who seek to arrest this man under the cover of darkness. The same one who had openly appeared to them in the temple course just days before. And then John puts in parenthesis the fact that Judas, the traitor, stood among them. So how does Jesus respond? He uses a phrase that has such deep significance for John. The very phrase that we have been looking at over the last five weeks. He answers, I am. I am he. That same phrase that God had used to reveal himself to Moses in the burning bush, I am. 
And so once again, we can only but picture the scene which is given in some degree by what we've just seen. If it were not so somber and tragic, it might even be laughable. This detachment of battle-hardened soldiers confronting a few defenseless disciples in the dead of the night and with just two words, Jesus has them falling to the ground. We sometimes sing a song, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. No wonder Paul would later write in Philippians, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So who's in control here? Is it the Roman soldiers? Is it the temple guard? Is it Judas? No, it's none of them. It is Jesus. And so he says, if you're looking for me, then here I am, but let these disciples go free. In giving himself up to his enemies, he ensures that his disciples do go free. Just another act of Jesus that is a foreshadowing of the cross. For isn't that precisely what he did for us? As Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He set us free. And John is quick to remind us that this itself was a fulfillment of prophecy. That none of the disciples would be lost. But poor old Peter who we can identify with so well, doesn't quite realize that the situation is entirely under Jesus' control. And in typical impulsive fashion, with reckless abandon, he steps forward and he takes a swipe at the high priest's servant. We've got to remember that Peter is a fisherman, not a swordsman. And he just ends up cutting off his ear. Did his actions improve the situation? No. But then before we point a finger at Peter, don't we do exactly the same thing? How many times have we intervened or interfered with something that God is already doing only to make a total mess of it and make the situation so much worse? All too often, I fear. But Jesus, the healer, restores the servant's ear just another testament to who he really was. But somehow I do not see this as the only miracle in the story. Have you ever wondered how Peter got out of that alive? To draw a sword on anyone in the midst of a detachment of Roman soldiers and still come out unscathed. How is that possible? That in itself is a miracle. And again, it was to fulfill the prophecy that not one of them will be lost. God is always true to his word.
But let's just pause for a moment. Whose ear has been cut off? John gives us his name. His name is Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Who was the one who commissioned Jesus' arrest? We read in verse 14 of that same chapter that it was Caiaphas, the high priest. After Jesus healed his ear, can you just imagine how that servant felt? Can you imagine what his testimony was? Can you not picture him rushing back to the temple courts, coming into the chamber of Caiaphas and the other religious leaders to tell them what had happened? And I'm not sure how the dialogue went, but I just made up a dialogue. Maybe it went something like this. So Caiaphas asks, so how did it go? Went off very well. Well, did you get him? Yes, he was arrested by the guard. Did he resist or give you any trouble? No, not really. But one of his disciples did. What do you mean? And you can just see everybody now leaning in, looking at Malchus to hear his response. Well, um, he kind of took a swipe at me with his sword. But you seem to be okay. How did he miss? Well, that's just it. He didn't. What do you mean he didn't? You're not hurt, so did he hurt somebody else? No, no, he cut off my ear. Look, Malchus, I'm not blind. I can see that you have both ears. Now, your grace, I know, I know that, but he really did. But then the one you told us to arrest, that Jesus fellow, he just touched my head and my ear was instantly restored. One minute I saw it on the ground and the next minute it was back on my head. Can you just imagine the deathly hush in that chamber? History shows, sadly, that rather than that softening the heart of Caiaphas and the religious leaders, that his testimony probably hardened them all the more. Because just hours later, he put into motion the greatest travesty of mock justice the world has ever known. The charade that would unfold would bring about the scourging, the beating, the mocking, the humiliation of the Christ and ultimately his crucifixion. And yet a parting thought. I wonder if not every day thereafter, whenever Caiaphas saw his servant, he was reminded of the one who had healed him. And just somewhere in the deep recesses of his soul, he wrestled with the truth as did the soldier at the foot of Jesus' cross. And I wonder if ultimately in his heart of hearts, he did not come up with the same conclusion, that surely, surely, this was the Son of God.